Go. <laughs> I'm Ranger Jake Suter from Canyonlands National Park, uh, River District, and I've been the project lead for tamarisk removal and riparian restoration in the park for the last five years. And I'm gonna show you guys some of the work that we've been doing down along the Colorado River. Cool, and we're at the confluence of the green in Colorado right here. Sweet. Didn't know you were getting into this. <laughs> Look at this, dude! <laughs> this is awesome! He's been doing this with all of the rangers. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny how he walks right into like a perfect thing all the time. So about seven years ago, uh, we originally started doing some tamarisk removal um, in this area. And there's a large Goodings Willow, not this first one we see, but the next one. Okay. We actually started there cutting tamarisk. And we've cut almost an entire river mile of tamarisk up on this upper bench. And and why start here? Just because it's high profile or? Um, when we decided to take on the, the river restoration project, uh, we evaluated each of our cut sites on three criteria. First one being the density of large native trees. Okay. So you can see up here, we got all of our goodings, willows or cottonwoods right. and that kind of stuff. The second thing we were looking at is the density of tamarisk um, around all of these native species. And if you look across the river, this whole section of river over here, that's what all of this looked like up here once upon a time. Okay. So then the third piece of criteria that we used to evaluate was the frequency or the, the, the use of the area for our visiting public. Okay. So where these high density of trees are, lots uh -huh. of dead and dying tamarisk, uh -huh. plus a high use area is what we ended up saying, the confluence needs to be cut so we can protect these trees in case of human caused fires. And the tamarisk were dying partly because of the beetle release from the Correct. Grand County Ag guy? Correct. Uh -huh. um, Kenny and Lance never released the beetle but it happened everywhere else and we've been benefiting from it uh ever since and what year was that roughly do you know uh they started the release in 2008. okay oh, i see cage <laughs> yeah so this is one of our cottonwoods and um every spring or for the last two springs we do a river trip starting in in mid-february and we go down the Green River and we find sandbars that are exposed that have baby cottonwoods growing out of them. And we'll actually dig those baby cottonwoods up and do a bare root transplant, Okay. take them home. And then we, um, we have three foot tall, four inch diameter PVC that we split in half. Mm -hmm. And we lay the tree in there with a bunch of soil, mm -hmm. stand them up, and then we water them for the next couple of months. Now the soil, are you using a... A sort of augmented potting mix, or are you just using regular nope. bank soil we, we, kind of stuff? We go down to one of the boat ramps on the uh, uh, mineral bottom, uh -huh. and we actually dig up some of the sand that's down there. So it's, uh -huh. it's what the cottonwoods would normally be growing in, and okay. we take all that back, and then we fill the tubes up and plant the trees in them. Okay. So when we plant, when we harvested this tree, it was only about two and a half inches tall. Cool. The root system on it, though, was almost 18 inches deep. So by burying it or, or planting it in that three-foot cylinder, what we get is those roots right. to elongate right. as right. much as possible. So then we wait for the high water to come up, and as that high water comes up, we see where the high water mark is, and then we bury the trees just above the high water and mark. And that's like March-ish, or when, when is high water uh, for here? High water this year was right about second week of June. Okay, okay. So then as that water recedes, the water table and the sandbar starts to go down, and we plant those roots down in there. And our thought is, or our theory is, if we plant it during that time... It raises go, them down. Right. It cool. helps to draw those root systems cool. down. That way we can minimize the time that we actually have to come out here and physically water them ourselves. And how often do you guys water the, uh, manually water these guys? Um, we do it once a week, but we, we've been partnering with all the river outfitters and even uh, private trips, and we tell them if they ever see a cage in a cottonwood to water it. Very cool. Cottonwoods always, always, always can use water. That's cool. And so, and so this guy is, 
is well, so so he was last year's ceiling, right? right? Yep. So what what do you uh, and you've been doing this for a couple years now? So how these guys are growing several feet a year? What what are you getting yeah, off these guys? Yeah, if if we can get them planted at the right time in the right area with the right soil composition into the water table, we're seeing anywhere from two to three feet of growth a year on on these new guys. And and are, so when we do this stuff, we need to go down deep so we don't have you know burrow you know gophers and things but you guys probably don't have problems with that so this this is just simply for deer brows and 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 sheep brows and stuff like that beaver beaver and beaver, beaver. oh i forgot you guys still have beaver beaver <laughs> is, is probably one of the biggest predators of our native vegetation in the area um and they'll cut you know two foot diameter trees down and not even think twice about it um, and the only there, there's only two natural or three natural predators, you know, you got your coyotes You know and your your different cat species that will hunt beaver But the other natural predator of the beaver is actually the high flows uh, Of the river and that's what helps to flush those beaver keep them moving uh -huh. and it kind of protects the native species but ever since we've had the post dam flows, we haven't had the high water that flush the beaver out like uh, it once does. So, so they we, get really high density. So we actually have an increase in the density of beaver uh -huh. along the river corridor. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so so um, then you're going to leave this guy on. So when we do this stuff, we leave it on for the first couple years and then we yank it. But you guys probably, the idea is leave it on as long as you can. So we'll, we'll leave this here as long as we can. Um, and then after, after we know it's well established, um, we know it's growing good. And we don't have to water it. We'll come down with a uh, six inch irrigation pipe mm -hmm. and we'll split that in half and then we'll wrap the trunk. Uh -huh. okay. And then we put a, a little bigger, uh, heavier duty gauge around there and okay. we'll pull it up so it's about four feet tall. So like, like hardware cloth kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, either that or, or kind of like that hog paneling type uh -huh. of thing. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. a little more okay. stouter and we want it to be about four feet tall. Okay. That way the deer don't try to uh rip the bark off and kill the tree that's cool and then have you guys been monitoring the stuff you have done already success how, how well are these guys surviving um we're do with this way of planting we're seeing about a uh 35 to 40 percent success rate uh -huh. um you know and that's and, what we get in louisiana basically right and and what we're what we're really trying to focus on um you know this was just a thought we have last year of trying it this way um, and what we're seeing is the soil composition and where we choose to plant really makes a difference totally. on how well they establish. And obviously, the further up the bank you go, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the harder it is for those trees to right. establish. Um, this guy's doing pretty good. Uh, you can see we're not that far above the water table. And yeah, we're, I, so people who can't see us, we're about like three feet or so-ish, right? What would you say? Maybe? Oh, no, we're probably about... Eight to ten feet. Eight. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. We're okay. about eight to ten feet above above the water's edge, but right. you can see the current water's edge. The current water's <laughs> edge, but you can see the 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 sand is still fairly well saturated up right. to this point. So, chances are this root system is going to make the water table and, and succeed fairly well. That's awesome. And how many sites? So this is the confluence is a site. How many? You guys have like two or three sites. You have half a dozen uh, sites. How many? We have. We have. Uh, Lathrop Canyon up on the Colorado. We have Indian Creek uh, that we've planted stuff at. We've got um, here at the confluence, we got Upper Spanish Bottom, we got Lower Red Lake. And then once you get down into Cataract Canyon, we've got Rapid 1, Rapid 5, Rapid 27. Oh, very cool. Um, so we've planted uh, awesome. quite a few trees all over the place. So. Um, well, that's yeah. awesome. So some park units I know, basically all they can manage is sort of enforcement and interpretation, mm -hmm. some sort of farm this stuff out to USGS or right. whatever. Right. But I'm, I'm really super stoked to hear you guys are doing it in-house. That's great. Yeah. Another yeah. great example of stuff the Park Service does, <laughs> another reason for maybe slightly increased budgets maybe to help support some of this cool stuff. You know, a little more money to do this kind of work down here would never hurt us. Um, and, and, and this I is cheap by most standards right right and actually we uh we apply for funding through a, a program that that funds projects using user fee dollars so oh, okay cool the money that we spent to get this tree here the money we spent to clear all the tamaris that's up above mm -hmm. here um all of that money was paid for by user fee dollars so awesome. when you come into the national park and you pay your fee 
that money uh we applied to get that money to pay for this project that's cool and so can people volunteer in the, the february clearing if you guys need help yep uh we run a couple of projects a year uh where either we come down and and uh um you know harvest the cottonwood trees but then the biggest thing that we need help with is is the actual removing of the tamarisk. clearing because uh -huh. all this tamarisk here uh whenever we remove this stuff we actually cut it in place and we have to carry it all the way to the river's edge and throw it in the river to get rid of that material you don't burn it or herbicide the stumps no, or anything like that we do herbicide the stumps um but we we don't burn it and the reason we don't one of the largest reasons we don't burn it is the fact that a tamarisk fire burns so hot Mm -hmm. That it actually completely nukes the soil. It oh, interesting! All the minerals, all the nutrients. It kills the seed bank completely. And then what we get after that is a really healthy dose of non-native invasive Grasses. species uh -huh. that come back in. Uh -huh. um, primarily, we see a lot of uh, uh, Russian thistle. Uh -huh. that, that's that's our big nemesis. Uh -huh. um, you know, when it first when it first burns that next year, you know, we usually have a, a bumper crop of that stuff. So. Cool. Well, great. Well, it's awesome to see cool uh, hardwood restoration going on. Well, at least not hardwood, but, but um, woodland restoration going on here uh, in the Grand Canyon and uh, Canyonlands National Park on the Colorado River. Good job, you guys. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>